Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and I'll be speaking today uh, on the epistle reading for Christmas Day uh, in Series B, namely Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Uh, this epistle lesson uh, is one of the, the great uh, Christological um, uh, discussions that we find in the various New Testament books. It's one of those uh, clear texts that speaks about Christ as the Creator who has brought all things to the conclusion through His death and His resurrection and His ascension to reign. Uh, and so it fits nicely with this emphasis in our Gospel lesson for Christmas Day, namely Christ as the one who is the eternal Word, who then uh, became flesh. Uh, so you see some of those same themes that from John chapter 1, the prologue of John, in this prologue or introduction to the epistle uh, to the Hebrews. So uh, if I, when I'm preaching on this text on Christmas Day, uh, the thing that I would emphasize is what it is teaching us about the person of Christ. This child that was born in Bethlehem, which we, um, as we preach from Luke chapter 2 on Christmas Eve, uh, now we're uh, focusing in terms of how God has brought that eternal Son into this world to bring about his work of salvation. Uh, you see that in our epistle lesson. Let's go to the text uh, as we go to the board, the Greek text. And we see here uh, a contrast in the opening uh, verse about God and him speaking. Uh, and again, it's speaking a little bit about the Old Testament uh, versus now the climactic prophecy uh, the climactic revelation that has come in his son. And you see in this first verse this contrast between God speaking in the prophets and God speaking in the son. Uh, and I think here one can say in the Old Testament, God through the son revealed himself by speaking to individual prophets who spoke to people. The contrast is now the son has come in human flesh and the one whose lips they have heard the word of God from, uh, the one whose life they have seen God active, is none other than the Son. So here he starts off, uh, the author starts off with, in many times, in many uh, places, uh, or ways rather, so many times and many ways, uh, you have in the past, Right here, God has spoken, uh, God spoke to uh, our fathers, or to the fathers, namely to our spiritual forefathers, by the prophets. And again, this contrast then is between how God spoke in the Old Testament. Moses and the various prophets spoke the word of God, revealed the word of God to people, and now you have this contrast within um, in these latter days. And again, you see that eschatu. Uh, we, with the, the birth of Christ, we, the latter days have dawned. We live in the end times. Christmas marks the, 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 uh, the incarnation and the birth of Christ mark the start of the end times that we, uh, we live in. Uh, but in these latter days, he spoke to us, he has spoken to us, uh, us in his Son. So again, the contrast of the Old Testament uh, period versus now with the incarnation, birth of Christ, ministry of Jesus forward, we now have the revelation of God through the Son. Uh, and uh, again, this unique time that we live in where we have not only heard God through prophets, but we've had the ultimate revelation of God by his son taking on human flesh, living before us, talking to us, and ultimately also dying and rising again. So the climax of God's revelation happening 
in the Son, very much of a stress of these first two verses. And then he talks about what that, who that Son is um, as he uh, continues in, in this uh, um, verse 2, whom, you see these relative pronouns, you see them in several places in these uh, first few verses, whom he appointed, and namely God is the actor of this verb, God appointed as an heir of all things. And here this language is very similar to the kind of language that, um, that we find uh, in uh, the prologue of John in the sense that uh, um, Christ is the one in whom God brings all things together and through whom God redeems all of his creation. Here it's a little more explicit of him being the heir of all things, namely the one who will inherit all rule. He is the, the one who is not only the creator at the beginning, but who will bring all things to their completion, the inheritor of all things, the universal ruler uh, of, the, of the, the cosmos, of the galaxies. So you appointed heir of all things, and then you have that, um, that uh, uh, through whom you have the preposition dia here, just because you have the vowel, the alpha drops out. Uh, so you have through whom, again the relative pronoun, he made the ions. Uh, so here the emphasis is he has made all of creation. Uh, here, just as in John chapter 1, uh, here you have an emphasis of, of the Son as the Creator. Uh, and one can say there's no clear testimony to the divinity of, of the Son than the fact that he, has, has, he is the one through whom uh, all creation has been brought into being. We see this in the prologue of John, but certainly it's testified to wonderfully here. It's not that he made a few things, but he has made the entire creation here. Uh, is, is, this is the testimony. Uh, if, if, this is, if, if it's saying that the Son made things, it means he is none other than within the unity of the one God of Israel, Yahweh. He is Yahweh. We can't ascribe creation to the Son without understanding him in his full divinity. And that's certainly testified to in this verse too. And then we go on with another relative pronoun. So, uh, who being, you have the participle here, and then an interesting uh, title for the Son here. The radiance of the glory. Uh, here, this language of, of glory is emphasizing that Christ is the one who is always been the reflection or the image of God. You think about this in the Old Testament, how the glory of the Lord appeared um, in um, on Mount Sinai and Moses and Israel saw uh, the glory and the glory goes into the tabernacle and, and dwells there and then into the temple when Solomon builds the temple. And this sun is the radiance of the glory. He is the one who reflects God's uh, presence. He is the visible image of God. That's what Paul calls him in Colossians chapter 1, that great Colossians hymn, the image of the invisible God, or the visible image of the invisible Father. And then he, uh, another way of expressing this is found in this next phrase. The exact imprint, and here you have the, the, uh, the image, the, um, the picture of um, like a, a stamp or um, a seal where uh, he is the imprint of his nature or being. So the Father's being is visibly seen in the Son. Uh, this is the close unity between the Father and the Son. To look at the Son is to see the the imprint, uh, if you will, when a, when a coin is made or when a, 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 you have the, the, the image of that and, and really Christ the Son is the image of, of God the Father. 
So um, a wonderful way of stressing he is the radiance of the glory and the exact imprint of his, of his being or his person, his nature. Uh, and then speaking a little bit about his work, uh, you have here this understanding of bearing or caring, again a participle, all things by what? His word, very interesting, and one might say um, somewhat very closely related to the language of logos. Uh, here, I'll try to get that clear. There we go. Logos. Uh, remita is simply uh, another way of rendering the language of word, the word of his power. This is a reference to the divine name. So he sustains all things by the name that he has. He is none other than Yahweh. And so he upholds all of creation. Um, and, and this is a, a reference uh, uh, to him, really, I think, uh, very much in line with John 1, uh, being the word of God. Then he, uh, the, uh, the language of what his work is, uh, here you have the participle, after having made, it's an aorist participle, uh, purification for the sins. So all of Christ's work here, if I'm preaching on Christmas Day, this is a wonderful way to tie Christ as creator with Christ as redeemer here. Beautifully in this uh, text, you have, after having made purification for the sins, that certainly is a reference to his sacrificial death. He's the high priest. Hebrews uh, emphasizes this all the way through his epistle. Then you have the, um, uh, so making purification, um, you have the, uh, the uh, making purification, then you have here the verb, he sat down. So having completed the work of redemption at the cross, then he rises and ascends. So all of Christ's work is, is, is um, uh, summarized in the fact that he is then put in this position of being seated at the right hand of the majesty. Here's a reference to the Father. He is the majesty on high. So the Trinitarian um, reality is brought out wonderfully in this uh, short uh, text. He's seated at the right hand. It's not, uh, that is uh, the, the key position of power in the throne of God. The fact that he is seated shows that he is full divinity because he's sharing the, the key the, the one and only throne of the one God of Israel, and he's actually in the key position of power. He, the, the right hand is the place of power, it's the place of decision. So the right hand of the majesty on high. Uh, so the, the one throne of God is shared by the Son. This is very profound in the first century. We're so used to it because we, we speak and preach about it, but imagine as this was being written in the first century, this is a very profound statement of Christ's divinity. And again, it's connected to that key pre-existence of Christ as the creator and his key work of redemption, namely having um, made purification of sins, all the sins of the world, universal justification brought out in that verse. And then verse four, continues, um, just as um, he has been, uh, uh, um, just as here in, in this verse, uh, having become, you have the, the participle right here, uh, and ha having become, uh, maybe a way to, to render this would be, uh, having become as much superior here you have this language of being superior to the angels um, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So the, the language of is more excellent here, um, is more excellent. So having become superior right here to the angels as the name he has inherited is greater than theirs. 
You saw earlier we had this mention of the word of power. That's a reference to his divine name. Here, the, the stress is, even though you have angels with great names, such as um, uh, uh, Michael, who is like God, uh, Christ has an even greater name. The name that he has inherited, namely the Son, is the name that, uh, that uh, he has had from eternity. That name has been revealed at uh, the, the, the ascension, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, that he is none other than Yahweh. So the name that he has inherited is the divine name, Yahweh. And that's superior to any na uh, angel name. Why? Because it's the unique name of the Father himself that's shared with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then, in verse 5, you have uh, this contrast between Christ and the angels. For which of the angels did, um, uh, did uh, what was it said, namely, which of these angels did the Father say, you are my son. Um, today, I, namely God, have begotten, perfect tense, you. This is from Psalm 2. Uh, you have uh, 2, verse 7. So this is seen as a Messianic psalm, speaking of not just some, the, the Davidic king and God, but speaking prophetically of the, the uh, enthronement of the Son. And that's how Hebrews certainly understands it, uh, that Christ um, is the unique reality that God has brought into the world. He's the eternal son that God has um, uh, brought into the world as the child born at Bethlehem. And this is none other than this God-man is none other than his eternal son. Uh, and again... Uh, you have this language uh, continuing in verse 5. Uh, again, another reference uh, to, uh, a, to uh, 2 Samuel, um, where you have uh, in this verse, when he brings the firstborn, uh, oh, here, right here, in the end of verse 5, first of all, I will be to him, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. That's a reference to 2 Samuel 7, verse uh, 14. And so you have that emphasis that, that uh, God, through the prophet Nathan, is telling David about the eternal son that will bring about the eternal kingdom. Hebrews is emphasizing that son is none other than uh, the eternal son that has been born as Jesus Christ, that suffered and died. That is the one who has established David's eternal um, uh, kingdom. And then verse 6 brings this all to, to a conclusion. Uh, you have, and again, when he brings, here you have hotan, so you're expecting the subjunctive. Right there, when he brings the firstborn, that's a, a title for Christ's pre-existence. He is the firstborn, namely he has existed prior to creation. It's a very exalted title in the first century. Became a dangerous title with Arius, though. Uh, but in the first century, very much stressing the pre-existence of the Son, Prior to anything of creation, we see that in, in the earlier testimony that he made all things. So the when he brought the firstborn into the, into the inhabited world, uh, uh, what did he say? Uh, to whom did he say? He said, uh, let all of God's angels, here you have the command, the imperative, let all of God's angels, what? Worship. Him. So the language of worshiping uh, to the Son shows the full divinity. And so the Son is distinguished very much from all of the ranks of angels, all of the other spiritual beings. He is the eternal one, and that eternal Son has become flesh in Jesus. 
and he is worthy, that, that little baby in Bethlehem is worthy of our worship. If I'm preaching this on Christmas Day, I'm going to stress this also, namely our worship of the flesh and blood Jesus. Um, we don't, we give adoration with the various angelic realms, but to the one God who is now also taking on human flesh, that one we worship. That's brought out clearly. And so uh, the, the very special nature of the revelation that's happened in Jesus is stressed here. So in conclusion, uh, when I'm preaching this uh, epistle lesson on Christmas Day, uh, it's wonderful in the way that it stresses the pre-existence of the Son. He's the creator of all things. He has the unique name of God that sustains all things. Uh, his name is greater than any angel's name. Uh, that one is the same one who took on human flesh, who made purification for our sins. Not only is creation emphasized, but also redemption is emphasized. And then, uh, because of that, uh, unlike angels whom we worship with, the Son is one who is the focus of our worship. Uh, on this Christmas day, we worship the true God who has revealed himself in the Son, that Son who grew up to be crucified and then to rise and then to ascend and reign forever. May the Lord bless your proclamation and your worship of the Christ child on this Christmas day.